I've settled into a comfortable routine, work eight hours for five days, then head to the bar on Fridays. I'd picked up a Saturday shift, but because my job was at a call center, I could still go in hungover from the night before. Shift or not, I always spent Friday nights at the local bar. There were four local women I often picked up for dates. They weren't looking for a real relationship, and they were all aware of the others. Keeping things casual didn't cause drama. One of them worked as the bartender. We had been spending nights together less and less now. After a drink, she told me the reason. I found a boyfriend, Jesse said, sliding over a fresh beer. Call me if he's anything like the last one. She looked younger than she was and acted like it. Some guys took advantage of her, causing most of the town to get involved chasing them off. Jesse was like our local cute mascot. I bet most people didn't want her seeing me on the odd occasion. Still, I was better than all the other guys she dated. The last one, I ended up breaking an entire row of his teeth. Somehow, she recovered fast from all of the bad boyfriends. She wasn't the kind of girl to show the world how trauma affected her. I admired and worried about her. He's going to be by soon. Stick around and see if he passes. I was going to stay for a little while regardless. Soon, a guy walked in, brushing off the rain from his shoulders. He was tall and thin as a pole. His face brightened when he saw her. He rushed over to place a small object wrapped in a plastic bag on the bar. He quickly pulled out a small cactus and a plastic pot. I wanted to get you flowers, but they die so fast. This shouldn't. I printed out how to take care of it. He excitedly told Jesse. He looked in my direction, but he didn't know who I was. He must have just recently moved here. He looked like a wet noodle with the personality of a puppy. I could tell he wasn't the annoying type to go around calling women queens or that sort of shit. He was in love with her. Simple as that. I dug around in my pocket to pay for my tab. This guy passed the test with a cactus. <laughs> when I was about to leave, he caught up with me to offer one of those small fold-up umbrellas since it had started pouring out. Yeah, he was alright. I lived near the bar. The cold rainy weather always made my leg hurt, so I walked slower than normal on those sorts of nights. As I walked, I reflected on some thoughts. Jesse might have found a perfect match. I now lacked one person to fall back on. Soon, the others I had a casual relationship with follow in her footsteps. I didn't get paid enough to move. There wasn't a single woman in town who would ever marry me. My life had officially stagnated. Work, home, bar. Repeat till dead. This sucks. I muttered to myself. I'd stopped in front of a bus shelter to rest against. My leg throbbing in the terrible weather. I heard a noise that caused me to glance inside the shelter. Under the dim light was a girl I didn't recognize. She heard me speak and looked up. When we made eye contact, she looked away. She didn't sit on the bench. I didn't blame her. The ground was cleaner than those benches. I saw the scars on her inner arms before she tucked her knees into her chest. She looked away, silently praying I would leave. It was cold as hell, and she was only wearing a baggy t-shirt and shorts. I spotted bruises on her pale skin. This was none of my business. I just needed to get home. Do you have anyone to call? I asked her as I got down to her level. She shook her head, but didn't respond. I was a strange guy talking to her after all. Do you want me to get you a cab somewhere? I offered. I put my hand in my pocket, and then mentally swore because I had left my phone at home. I didn't know anyone who lived nearby. My only other offer made me sound like a creep. I forgot my phone. If you want, you can come over and call a cab. I'll stay outside the entire time and pay for wherever you need to go, or I can rent a motel room for you if they have rooms, but honestly, the motel is nasty as hell. I saw a smile flicker on her face. She studied me with bright eyes and then nodded. I'll go over to your place. I trust you. She said in a soft voice. Well, what's your name? I asked when she stood up. Summer. She said in a way that made me assume she was lying. That was fine with me. I just needed something to call her. I'm Finn Farlow. I pulled out an ID for her to see. Since I was bringing her to my place, I wanted her to feel as safe as possible. I wasn't worried this was some sort of con. I had nothing to steal, and she couldn't hurt me unless she had a gun, which I highly doubted. I gave her the umbrella and showed her the way to where I lived. Sorry, it's not much. We walked across an RV park to the last lot, almost on the edge of the forest. Once you got used to it, living out of an RV year-round wasn't too bad. I let her go inside and planned to leave her alone when she made the call. She told me it was fine to be inside with her. She shook in her wet clothing. Whatever I said and did now would just make me appear even more like a predator. Do you want to have a shower to warm up? I have hot water. 
You can borrow some of my dry clothing even, though it'll be too big on you. I said, expecting her to be defensive. Instead, she agreed. I showed her how the shower worked and how the door locked and then got a change of clothing. I realized I didn't have any underwear for her. Thinking about her underwear situation made my skin feel gross. It was up to her what she wanted to do about that. Here, I'll leave what cash I have near the door with my phone. I offered with a change of dry clothing in my hands. She took them but didn't move towards the shower. I don't have anywhere to go. Can I stay here just for tonight? I'm exhausted and just need to rest. Aren't you worried I might try something? I asked, trying not to be threatening. I can take you. Summer replied with such confidence, I believed her at first. I laughed <laughs> a little, and that made her smile. I hoped she hadn't trusted the wrong person in the past. Judging from her scars, and without a roof over her head, I assumed she didn't have the best people in her life. I offered her something to eat, but she declined. After her shower, I offered her my small bedroom. I could sleep on the cramped couch. I've done it before. Aside from the bathroom, my bedroom was the only space with the lock. He looked at my worn baseball bat by the bedroom door. You needed a weapon when you lived in a high crime area. I didn't trust myself with a gun, but kept a few bats around. There were a few crime books around the room in case she was too stressed to sleep in a strange place. She thanked me as I closed the bedroom door. She looked so small in my old clothing. I hoped I never met the people who hurt her to get to this point because I knew I would be arrested for assault. Turns out, I'm very good at removing teeth. I expected to hear her lock the door, but she didn't. I wanted to believe it was because she fully trusted me and not because she no longer cared what a stranger could do to her. The couch wasn't comfortable, but worth it. I woke up sore, regretting taking an extra shift. I knocked on the door, waiting for an answer. When none came, I opened it just enough to peek in. She was curled up under all the blankets, looking terrible. Was she dealing with withdrawals? I got close to touch her forehead, finding it ice cold. No, this was something else. It's bright, she whispered, not opening her eyes. I got to work closing the curtains and taking out all the blankets I owned. I'll stay home from work. What do you need? I offered. She shook her head under the blanket pile. It's fine. I just need to sleep. Don't call in sick for me. I swear I'll be gone by tonight. I debated on ignoring her and staying. If I did, it would make me look too pushy. I wrote down my work phone number in case she needed anything. I didn't have a lot of cash, but I let her know where it was in case she needed something. Was she faking this for some money? Who cares? I would rather be out a bit of cash than not let an actually ill girl have a safe spot to rest. I waited for a call that never came. My shift went by without any issue. For once, I walked home with something important waiting for me. The sun set early because of the season. By the time I got back, it was getting dark. Summer had been up and about enough to make dinner. She sat at the table by the fold-out couch. She greeted me when I walked in. Her complexion appeared brighter, but not ready to let her go off on her own. You might need to reheat dinner, she told me. She sounded much better. I checked the pot and then pulled out two plates. The spaghetti and hot dogs, how did you know? I half-joked. It was the only thing left to cook. She answered in a serious tone. Here I was trying to take care of her and yet I wasn't really doing the best at taking care of myself. I made up two plates even though she made a half-hearted attempt to refuse to eat. She took a few bites, not appearing to enjoy the discount sauce and cheap noodles. One more bite. I told her when she started to push away her plate. She sighed and to show off, she took two more bites. I couldn't remember the last time a person sat across from me while I ate. I put aside my nearly empty plate to start asking the important questions. Do you have anyone looking for you? I pressed. She shook her head, unable to look at me. Not in the way you think. I left a bad situation. I know if the people I was living with catch up with me, it'll be bad for you. That answer implied not so great things. It left a bad taste in my mouth. Her hand went to her wrist to play with a cheap plastic bracelet with some animal beads. How old are you? Sixteen? She looked slightly offended by my assumption. Nineteen. She corrected. Well, that sucked. If she was younger, we may have had more options for her to be taken away from whoever she was with. Was it a boyfriend or family? In a way, she sounded like she was with a gang, but we had nothing like that around here. I know a good police officer. I started, but she shook her head. Did they force you to do anything? You won't be arrested. 
Well, depending on what they forced her to do, murder, then maybe. Other dirty work, then no. She was a victim either way, and I hated how she acted like getting help wasn't an option. I wasn't forced into sex work, if that's what you're worried about. More like manual labor. I waited for her to keep going, but she didn't. I stood up to put away the leftovers and to give her some time. She kept playing with her bracelet, mentally debating on what she could tell me. Where's your family? Depressed. She frowned and looked like she might cry for a moment. She collected herself long enough to speak. My parents were no contact with their families. They died a year ago because someone thought he could drive home high. I felt the pain in her words. My chest hurt as much as my leg at that moment. I sat down and she must have noticed a change in my demeanor. I know how much that can suck. I added, unable to say the right words in such a heavy moment. Yeah, it sucks a lot. I didn't have anyone else and fell back on whoever would have me. I think being on the street would have been better. Her last words sounded more like a thought to herself. What the hell did those people do to her? It was a relief to know she hadn't been assaulted, but what really happened? At first, the scars on her arms made me think she was addicted to anything she could inject. But the scars looked different. She had no signs of long-term drug usage like withdrawals. I considered she had gotten mixed up in some sort of underground medical testing. That didn't sound as crazy as it should. She had no family, so no one would look for her if she died. The scars on her arms appeared more medical than drug-related. If the people who ran that scam had money, she may fear making others into targets. I wanted more information, but it was clear that was all I would be getting from her that night. Let's play a game for a while. I said, and she looked surprised by the offer. Back when I was younger, I liked to play a version of Go Fish where you could lie. If someone asked if you had a card and you did, you could lie and say no. However, if you had the card the second time they asked you, you needed to give up the card. If you asked for the same card the other person had just requested and they didn't have it, you put two cards at the bottom of the deck. It was a simple change of rules added to a boring game. I often won using these house rules. Since I've played it this way hundreds of times on family trips, I never expected to get swept in the first five games. How are you so good at this? I asked after getting crushed yet again. I'm smart, that's all. I felt an odd pride from getting teased. I took my time to shuffle the cards. The noise of Summer playing with her bracelet distracted me for a moment. Do you like animals? I said, looking at the colorful beads. She paused, looking as if she would refuse to answer. Yes, I wanted to be a vet, but I doubt that's an option now. She sighed. What are you talking about? People get scholarships all the time. You're smart enough to get accepted. You beat me five times in a row. I don't think beating you is on the same level as getting a free ride to college. She shrugged, unable to hide a smile. Ouch. I started dealing the cards, wondering if I would be easily beaten in the next game. She looked far more comfortable than when she got here. In that moment, I felt like she was strong enough to move on from whatever had happened to her before. Whatever life gave her, she was a fighter. She may not have a lot of cards to work with now, but I decided I wanted to help her get some. Hey. I started, planning to let her stay as long as she needed. A sudden sound came from the roof that made her jump. She fell to the floor ready to hide under the table. I stood up to grab a bat to take care of what animal had landed on top of the RV. It was rare, but I did have a raccoon jump from the trees and onto the roof at night, still early for them though. When I got close to the door, Summer flew over, grabbing my arm to stop me. She was so strong, I bruised right away. She noticed and loosened her grip, but didn't free my arm. Don't go outside. We'll be fine if we stay here. She said, voice shaking. Another sound came. This time, it was as if someone was running across the roof. What the hell? I asked myself as I looked up, expecting to see an answer. A soft tapping made us look over to the window we had just been sitting at. A face greeted us with a wide smile. A man I didn't know was looking at us from outside and somehow upside down. His teeth were so sharp it should have been impossible. Oh no. After he spoke those words, sounds exploded all around us. Rocks came flying through the windshield, shattering the glass. The bedroom windows were also broken in. Bangs came from everywhere. Cackling laughter echoed outside, making it hard to tell how many people were attacking the RV. I held onto Summer tight as I found my phone. I knew it was charged, and yet it refused to turn on. The man in the window joined in the laughter. To my horror, his eyes shone a deep red. I wasn't seeing things. He had fangs and glowing red eyes. 
Who knows how many more of these monsters were outside. He smashed the window with his forehead, the wound healing in seconds. For some reason, none of them reached inside even with the windows broken. I grabbed a knife from the counter. Before he could act, I jabbed it deep into one of his glowing red eyes. He screamed, his face transforming into something monstrous. He fled into the darkness, knife and all. When I turned, I saw something that made my heart sink. Someone was at the door reaching for the handle. I picked her up around the waist and locked us inside the cramped bathroom. I closed the shower to block the view from those monsters outside. She sank to my floor on the verge of tears. I got down with her, my leg hurting in that position. Just let me outside. They'll leave you alone. I never should have dragged you into all this. I'm sorry. I'll make it right. I shook my head, refusing such an idea. I would rather die than leave you to those things. I told her sternly. You shouldn't say that about a monster like me. You're not. I started, but stopped after my words were cut off by another loud bang. For a moment, the sound settled down. We're dealing with vampires, right? That's easy. Like you said, we can just stay inside until we can move in the morning. She shook her head again, not agreeing with my plan. She was scared, and regret was tearing her apart. These vampires don't follow all the rules. I would know. With a shaking finger, she pointed at her open mouth. A set of pointed fangs became clear and a lot of answers came crashing down. She barely ate, didn't wake up until around sunset, pale skin, and only went inside the RV after I said she could last night. My bruised arms proved she also had some unnatural strength. She snapped her mouth shut, waiting for me to toss her out from knowing her secret. You're not like those guys outside. I told you, I would rather die than let those monsters get you. Why? I'm repressed. I let myself think about her question. Was it because I'm a man and that's what men do? Was it because she was cute or because I was trying to replace Annie? I don't think I need a reason, but if you want one, you remind me of my sister. For some reason, that caused tears to come to her eyes. She rubbed them away, ready to face whatever dangers were ahead. I wasn't even remotely aware of what was waiting for us or how powerless we were. All the sounds outside stopped, all the color drained from Summer's face as she reached out to grab hold of me. Don't listen to whatever he says. She blurted out. I opened my mouth to reply. Suddenly, my brain was full of static. I couldn't see where I was, and I no longer even understood who I was. Everything disappeared aside from one simple request. Amir. The voice that overtook my brain couldn't be resisted. I simply was no longer myself. I have no memory of leaving the small bathroom or leaving the RV. When the static disappeared, I stood outside in the cold night air the source of the voice in front of me. I heard Summer scream. My body moved slowly to see her being held back by two of the vampire goons. I called out to her. My body was cold from fear not being able to save her. A set of powerful hands came down on my shoulder, the fingers like vice grips. My head was painfully pulled back so a set of teeth could come down into my neck. I felt my awareness sink down into darkness. I didn't feel pain. I didn't feel anything. My entire body was being drained by some unseen force. There was no hint of light where I fell. The pain soon came because of the heavy emptiness cutting me to my very core. Then, something started to pour in. Something dark and disgusting. When I noticed it, the oily sludge half filled my empty body. I pushed back on it with everything I had. I didn't know what it was, I only knew I didn't want it. If I let it take over, I would no longer be myself. I struggled, the sludge pushing back with so much weight I thought I was going to be crushed. It felt like an eternity before my half-empty body started to get filled with myself again. The darkness and who I was mixed into each other while I was powerless to stop it. My eyes opened to a star-filled sky. I gasped for air as if I had been drowning. My chest felt like an elephant was sitting on it. My neck stung, but for some reason, my leg didn't hurt. The events of what happened came back to me. A vampire's face came into view looking down at me. His claws were out, ready to rip into my throat. This wasn't the one who had just taken a bite out of me, I knew that much. At that moment, I could only think of a few things. Summer was in trouble. I had changed, and I was thirsty as fuck. My teeth sank into his neck, ripping it apart. He let out a strangled cry as he collapsed into the ground. His body shriveled up within seconds. His blood helped with the thirst, but it wasn't enough. I doubted it would ever be enough. I spotted my next target. He moved in slow motion, unable to keep up with my feral state. I lost my mind for a few minutes. I guess I killed four of them before the voice that lured me outside spoke again. Stop. 
My body froze against my will. Slowly, my mind returned. I breathed, heavily staring at the creature that I hated so much it hurt. He was tall, with long, slick back hair. He wore all black, as if that made him look cool. He held an amused look on his face as he raised a hand to settle down his other minions. I wasn't expecting you to come back the way you did. I pushed forward, snapping my teeth at him. I got a half a step before whatever power he held stopped my body again. Now calm down. I'm a reasonable man. Bullshit! I snapped at him. My mouth was forced shut so I would listen to what he had to say. I am Noir, your new master. Like I've said, I am reasonable. It appears you are a special kind of vampire, like our friend there. The wounds you leave are hard to heal. He explained and paused to make a show of fixing his hair as if anyone cared. I wanted the little darling you sheltered to kill two vampires. Summer didn't have the stomach for such a thing and ran from us. Now, I'll make you a deal. Take the job, and both of you can be free. Again, bullshit. But I didn't have any choice. My body wasn't my own until I found a way to break free from his control. Noir let me speak, expecting a favorable answer. Let Summer go, and we'll talk. No can do, sport. If I do that, you have nothing to work for. Little Summer will stay with us until you finish the job. But I assure you, you shall not cause any harm to that poor creature. There is no time limit, but the sooner, the better. I forced through his control enough to see Summer shaking her head. Tears were in her eyes. She silently told me not to listen, but I didn't have any other options. I didn't trust this shitbag to keep his word. I needed to buy some time. If he said I was special, then maybe I had some sort of power to take him down. I wouldn't have been able to figure that out without him watching me. Fine, but if you go back on your word, I'll rip your throat out. I hissed. That was the plan either way, but he didn't need to know that. Noir smiled in a way he thought he had everything under control. A flash of pain came to my head, blocking out my vision for a few seconds. I saw two people, twins with pale skin. It was impossible to tell their gender. A location came to mind when the pain faded. I hated he had so much control over my mind. Go now, Noir said with a wave. Whatever held me back was released. I knew if I attacked him now it would be useless. I shot him a disgusted expression, then looked at Summer. She shook her head again, begging me to get away somehow. I didn't know how I was going to save her, but I would, no matter what. With one last look at her, I did something I hadn't been able to in years. I ran. The small town I grew up in never looked brighter. I changed in ways I didn't fully understand yet. I feared I would never fully discover what I was now. My body no longer felt like my own, and yet I pushed it forward for a girl I barely knew. My newly improved eyesight made it so I could see every corner of the dark streets. I heard people sleeping in their beds, the murmur of their heartbeats just background noise under the wind blowing past my ears. I knew it was cold, and yet my skin didn't register it. I didn't want to kill someone, let alone do what the asshole that attacked me wanted, but I felt like I would be able to tear apart a tank if I needed to. The church where my targets waited was over an hour away by car. I made it there on foot in under an hour. I'd run to the next town over, only slowing in the last few moments because my legs started to dully throb in pain. I stopped to catch my breath. Soon the pain faded away. Normally, my leg would stop me if I tried to even briskly walk anywhere. So far, I've discovered heightened senses I'd adjusted to immediately. The other vampires had claws, so I looked down at my hands, expecting to see them. I felt a little disappointed to see my normal nails. It wasn't as if I focused hard enough claws would appear. I did try mentally forcing my hands to become weapons, knowing I would need them in the upcoming fight. To my shock, my fingernails grew black and pointed. Maybe I could get claws if I focus hard enough. I'll admit, I tried to imagine a set of wings or transforming into a bat. No such luck. Looks like I didn't get as many abilities as I would have liked. I waited outside the church to debate on my next move. If those two were vampires, then was it alright to kill them? I had thought back to Summer showing her fangs. She wasn't a bloodthirsty monster. There had to be good vampires out there. What are the chances these twins were like her? I walked up to a stop sign by the church. I tore it from the ground without much effort. If those two were good vampires, killing them would make me a monster. Which was fine, because I wasn't exactly a good person even before getting bitten. I walked up to the stone steps, weapon in hand, with my mind made up. I would become any kind of monster needed to save Summer. The large wooden doors weren't locked. No force kept me outside without an invitation. 
This was a church, after all. Everyone was welcome. The air felt stale. I didn't burst into flames or have any negative reactions from being inside a house of God with terrible intentions. My targets were in plain sight. They were in the middle of lighting a mass of candles at the far side of the large room when I walked in. They froze, crystal blue eyes wide in fear. Another person sat in a pew nearby them. I focused on the figure to try and get information. Male, breathing steady. My senses told me he wasn't a threat. His heart rate was low, as if he was sleeping. I may need to deal with a witness, but I'll figure out when it happened. I didn't let the twin vampires move first. Something snapped inside my chest. I threw the metal sign clear across the room, narrowly missing their heads. It embedded itself in the wood behind them, cracking the shelf where the candles were sitting. I heard a deep growling echoing through the church. I wasn't aware it came from my throat. I crossed the room in half a second, fangs and claws out. I leapt into the air, aiming for the pair. For some reason, my jaw snapped against nothing. My stomach lurched as something caught the back of my shirt, sending my body painfully flying into the wooden pews. I cracked one in half from the impact. I thought I felt bones break, but I stood up seconds after the impact without any issues. I was confused as hell. The twins weren't the ones who attacked. My eyes flew around the room looking for the threat the rest of my senses didn't register. The man, who I assumed to be asleep, stood calming with a gloved hand out towards. My mind swam trying to figure out what he just did. Everything told me he was human not dangerous. My body moved against my own will, wanting to tear open his throat. The dull thirst I felt since I changed overtook everything at that moment. A wooden pew came flying from the side to crash into me. I screamed in brief pain. I thought I saw a flash of light, but this man didn't move. Did the twins have some unseen powers? I couldn't back out now, so I doubled down. I recovered to skitter around on all fours again. With insane speed, I reached the man, my body twisting to deliver a bone-breaking uppercut. His foot came down on my shoulder, shattering it. I was now certain I healed broken bones within seconds. They still hurt like fuck. I came down on him again. My punch stopped as he took one step back. His counterattack landed so fast I didn't see it. He hit the right side of my face so hard that a terrible cracking sound ripped through the church. Blood poured from my mouth from the impact. A second hit came half a second later. The impact on my left cheek rattled my brain so hard I saw stars. It would have been very nice if he stopped it at that. I found myself barely able to keep up with an utter beating. I was forced back, blinded by blood and pain. Even the block punch shattered bones that healed. Thirst grew so intense it almost overshadowed the pain. Finally, a kick to my stomach caused me to bounce downstairs I hadn't seen before. During the beating, one of the twins opened a trap door on the floor. For some reason, I couldn't see in the darkness of the church basement. A single light sat in the middle of the room. I got up, waiting at the bottom of the stairs, ready to ambush anyone who came down. The ambush didn't go well. The man jumped down and I raised my arms to block his kick aimed at my face. That one kick hit harder than any other attack he brought down. I was out for a few seconds, long enough to kick me across the floor and into a circle with odd symbols written around it. The thirst overtook my mind. I thought of nothing else but using all my power to sink my teeth into his neck. I got up, letting out a screech that would have peeled paint. I felt my face turn into something else for a moment. The man didn't even flinch. He swiftly pulled out a pistol and fired. It landed on my shoulder. I had thought I knew what pain felt like. That was nothing compared to the fire coming from the bullet wound. How long had I been inside the church? One minute? Two? This man utterly tore me apart in less time than it took to microwave a hot pocket. I lay on my back, gasping for air. Warm blood pooled under my body. I prayed for death. Anything to stop this humiliation. My vision was unfocused. I sensed the man getting near. And then, more pain came from my shoulder. The bastard was digging around in the wound. I mentally cursed him with every word I knew as I felt the bullet that somehow felt as heavy as the sun get ripped from my shoulder. For some reason, once it was removed, the pain became manageable. My body started to heal, and yet it felt like I was shutting down. To my horror, it was healing itself to death. I didn't have the energy to recover from my injuries, and yet I slowly kept healing. My eyes got heavy. I wanted to just sleep. I forced them open with thoughts of summer. I couldn't give up on her. I witnessed a confusing sight. That man had taken out an empty syringe to draw a small amount of blood from his arm as if he'd done this a thousand times before. The small scar on his inner arm made me realize what summer's scars were. Those bastards had been draining blood from her for who knows how long. An even more confusing thing happened. He forced a knee down on my chest as he stuck the needle in my mouth. When the blood touched my tongue, my entire body jolted. 
A rush shot through my veins as if I had just been injected with an overdose of caffeine. My heart raced and my mouth watered, wanting more of what I just tasted. As disgusting as it is to admit, that blood was the best thing I've ever had in my life. I needed a full minute to collect myself. My wounds healed without any traces. My hand shook from leftover energy even though he gave me a small amount of blood. I wasn't able to stand, so I just sat on the ground, shaking, feeling confused as hell. Who the ever-living fuck is this guy? He appeared to be in his mid-forties, each ear pierced with a simple black stud. His graying brown hair was neatly trimmed and his face is cold as stone. He wore a black Victorian trench coat over a simple gray sweatshirt and jeans. Nothing about him appeared special. He had cheekbones that would make women swoon, but I thought he needed to eat more. Why? I choked out in a shaking voice. What did you just do? Why heal me after beating my ass? And why was he protecting the twins? I glanced around to see them huddled next to each other. I tried to kill them, but they didn't enjoy seeing the one-sided fight. Virgin blood gives supernatural creatures all sorts of benefits for a currently undiscovered reason. He spoke in a short and to the point voice. His heart rate didn't change even after I laughed at what he said. A virgin? <laughs> at your age? I prodded, unable to help myself. Aside from my blood being very useful for my line of work, I simply have never felt the desire for sex. Again, a very sharp answer. Yeah, sure, whatever you want to tell yourself, man. I mean, how do you know if you've never had it? I was pushing my luck, it still didn't stop the shit-eating grin on my face. I should have expected to get forced back to the ground as he used his foot to crush my chest. I gasped for air. He let up on some of the pressure, but not enough for me to escape. Prove me wrong. Let's do it right here. He said with a voice colder than the stone walls around us. I sputtered, never expecting that response. I'm into girls. I shot back. I clawed at his legs with both hands. He didn't budge. How do you know you're not into guys? Have you ever tried being with one? Yeah, I should have seen my own words being thrown into my face a mile away. I snapped my mouth shut not wanting to dig a deeper hole. A slight hint of humor glimmered in his eyes. It faded as fast as it appeared. He got down low, adding slightly more force to his foot. I reached down, aiming for his throat with my claws. My nails hit his coat. Instead of fabric, the sharpened nails scratched something as hard as steel. I chipped a few, then got smart and pulled away. Are you religious? He literally pressed. I played along, biting back smart remarks. No. Have you read the Bible? Do you fully understand it? Why was he asking me something like that after I said no to his first question? He saw the confusion in my eyes and then kept speaking. Even though you're not religious and don't fully understand it, you still respect people devoted to their faith. I let his words roll around in my brain for a few seconds. Yeah, but sex is different. A crushing weight came down, breaking a few ribs. Lesson learned. I need to keep my mouth shut. Hunter, that's enough. You've been too cruel. The twins came to my rescue. They ushered him away, the man appearing as calm as before. Noir had forced what they looked like, their location, and their names into my mind. I couldn't tell them apart, but I knew one was named Uma and the other one was Mouse. They wore black robes of some sort. Even though they were vampires, they acted kinder than the only human in the room. I stood up, ready for Hunter to try and stop me. I took a risk and sharply turned to start running. My face slammed into an invisible wall. I was getting tired of all these unseen powers bullshit. What the fuck? I shouted, holding my bruised face. Magic. Hunter spoke without a hint of humor. What the shit? I snapped. The twins took a step back into Hunter. I was trapped, and yet they were acting like a pair of rabbits ready to run. They calmed down when Hunter put a hand on their shoulders. For an asshole, he was a comforting figure for those two. So, you're clearly a new vampire. Hunter said, giving me another look over. The twins' faces lit up. They acted as if someone just mentioned a niche interest of theirs. They got closer to my prison, blue eyes shining. We're always glad to show the new ones the right way. How old are you? Uma, I think, asked. I stopped to think, not aware of how much time had passed since I got bitten. I could take a guess, though. What time is it? I replied. The twins' reaction wasn't a comforting one. Even though I'd come in here ready to kill them, they both appeared remorseful for my current situation. We're sorry. It seems like you've been dragged into Noir using you as a pawn. We had wished to resolve this peacefully. The other twins spoke. I met a girl from the looks of things. They were using her as a blood bank for a few years until that nutcase turned her. I was bitten because I let her crash in my place. I don't regret meeting her. I just want to help her. 
I told them while hoping Summer was still alright. I found it odd that a vampire wanted to go the peaceful route. I didn't get any kind of bad feelings from them. What could they have possibly done that pissed off Noir enough to try and kill them? You got lucky. Normally bitten vampires go feral. It takes a while and a few victims before they regain their senses, but they're never the same person they were before. The kind of vampire you turned into is so rare, I doubted it happened. Hunter said as he pulled a package of cigarettes from his coat pocket. The smokes were stolen from him by the slightly shorter twin. I hadn't smoked in years, but the sight of them and the stress of the night made me want to start. Instead of asking for one, I pressed for more answers. Special? How so? I asked, having no idea why I was so different. Hunter appeared annoyed as if he was dealing with a child. He humored me enough to give a hint. What are you doing that the twins aren't? He asked. I focused hard on them. I still didn't understand my new senses. We were both standing and looking at each other. I felt something from them, an odd force hidden away deep inside their bodies. I guessed that was how much power they held. Even if Hunter didn't beat my ass, I didn't have a chance against these two. I let out a frustrated sigh. The loud sound made everything click. They're not breathing? I asked, shocked over that observation. Hunter gave a sarcastic clap. I focused harder. Their hearts beat only once or twice a minute. From what I could tell, they only took in air to speak. Instead of the normal systems, born vampires use magic to make their bodies function. Hunter explained. Magic? I asked with a raised eyebrow. Duh. Why do you think you're stuck in that circle? Uma silently scolded him for being so mean. I took a few steps, testing the trap I was still stuck inside. I accepted vampires being real so quickly, but I almost drew the line in magic. It explained how a human took down a vampire, even a new one as easily as he did. It felt like he was cheating a little. Am I like that one guy from, you know, uh, th those movies? Cute. He had cool swords and sunglasses. Blade! Right, he was, he was turned into a half-vampire too, right? I asked, thinking back to the movies I watched years ago. The pair didn't seem to know what I was talking about. Hunter appeared offended by my suggestion. His face looked like he had just eaten something sour. Blade was a half-vampire because his mother was bitten before she gave birth to him. Get it right. He spoke in a tense voice. Why are you so defensive about that? I commented, but got no answer. Hunter had already moved on. No, you're not a half-vampire. You're called the living vampire. You can be out in sunlight, but it'll give you a sunburn that will take a month to heal. You can eat small amounts of food, and you don't need an invitation inside someone's home. If you don't get one, you'll become so unsettled you can't stay inside for long. A half-vampire is when a vampire has a child with a different species. In theory, vampires can mix with a great deal of creatures. The birth rates have dropped in the recent generations, so lately there has only been half-human, half-vampires. This was all a bit much. It was good to know more about what I had just become, but did I really need to know about other vampires? That's all good and all, but I need to save my friend. I only came here because he said I could get Summer back if I killed those two. You all seem strong, so why don't we work together to kick Noir's ass? I offered. Hunter shook his head and the twins frowned. They wanted to help, but only if they weren't using violence to solve their problems. I'm not as strong as you may think. I'm only human. We don't have powers and need to rely on magic items to fight on an equal term with monsters. With the right training, you could beat me in a fight. The twins are powerful. They're from a very important family and 16 generations removed from the three sons of Noff. If you knew about vampire lore, you would realize that's a big deal, but they're not fighters. I listened again and wondered how much of this information was actually important. So far, what I found out is that with enough training, I could repay Hunter for how he greeted me. And I might even be able to take down the twins despite the power difference. But after spending a little time with them, I already found myself between a rock and a hard place. It would be easier if they were downright evil. Killing them felt on the same level as killing Summer with my bare hands. Why does Noir want them dead? Is there a way around all of this? I started to pace within the small written circle on the floor. Would I kill these two if it came down to it? I was ready to become a monster, but now I started to question if I had the stomach for all of this. We had hoped to be able to talk this out. Uma started. It all comes down to messy politics. As you know, there are two kinds of vampires. Born vampires and bitten vampires. The born vampires all belong to a handful of dwindling families. Due to the low birth rates, there may only be a born vampire every hundred years or so. 
Twins like us have only happened five times since vampires came into existence. Because of our pride, nearly all born vampires are... You stop trying to think of the right word. Stuck up. Hunter finished. Uma sighed and agreed with him. The other twins started speaking. Born vampires consider bitten vampires as lesser. Noir has been trying to prove he's just as powerful as any other vampire, but the families won't give him respect. He started to take down as many born vampires as he can. So far, he's killed two. He picked us next because we do not like to kill others. Life and blood are valuable after all. He's also targeted us because we hold the means to summon our ancestor. Our family is directly connected to the youngest son of Noth. If we die and we lose that ability to summon him, it's as if he's died as well. That deals a great blow to our family's power. This felt like a stupid reason for Summer to get hurt. Who cares about Noir's pride? If he didn't care about what others thought about him, it would save him a lot of grief. After hearing what they had to say, I understood why the twins were so kind. Unlike other animals, they didn't need to kill what they drained the blood from. Keep it alive and you have a replenishable food source. I doubted most vampires had the same outlook. Noir would gladly kill as many as he could get away with. There would be no way he and the twins could meet eye to eye. Why don't you summon this impressive ancestor to have them deal with the problem? I suggested. We don't know how. They both shrugged. Our father has a very sink or swim mindset. He only told us the means to summon the youngest is within ourselves. If we hadn't hired Hunter, we would have been dead by now. Uma honestly admitted. And why is that? Hunter asked them. We're a little too trusting. I could see that. I bet if Noir asked them to come out and talk, they would fall for it. Even if Hunter was only hired to help, he truly seemed to care about the pair. Who could blame them? They were nice. Totally, they needed to be protected at all costs. Suddenly, all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Alarm bells went off in my head as my body sensed something before my mind caught up. The rest noticed the threat as well. A shrill, <laughs> ominous laugh echoed through the darkness. The twins stiffened, and then their bodies turned into a white ball of mist. Both flew off to hide somewhere, letting Hunter deal with the threat. He turned his back towards me, a gleaming silver sword suddenly in his hand. For a second, I was so distracted by where the hell he pulled that out from that I didn't notice the one walking closer to us. A beautiful woman stopped just on the edge of where the light could reach her. She had a very dangerous air about her. Long fangs poked over the top of her lips when she smiled at us. Her red hair matched the dress she wore and her glowing red eyes. I guess she was another vampire noir sent because he doubted I could finish the job. You all do talk so much. How boring. It was interesting to watch this baby get taken apart, but then you stop to just go on and on about vampires. Who cares? Let's get to the fun part. First, let's kill you, Hunter. He said with a cruel voice. Do you know her? I asked Hunter because she used his name. Nope. He answered, ready for an attack. I then realized Hunter wasn't his real name. Just what he called himself because of his profession. She moved faster than my eyes could see. A blast of heat tossed me back. I was blinded by white light for a second. I blinked, trying to recover and to see what happened. The circle I had been trapped in was destroyed. I could move around freely. So what? I looked over just in time to see the vampire hit Hunter in the stomach so hard he went flying. The guy that took me down so fast had just been knocked out in two hits. The sword clattered to the ground near my hand. I dove to pick it up. The damn thing was heavy as hell. I could barely keep it in waist tight. Hunter, get the fuck up! I shouted at him. The jerk stayed down. My mind was racing, unable to think of what to do. Fear tore apart my stomach as my eyes darted around, looking for flashes of red. My body reacted before my brain did again. I moved out of the way of an attack. Sharp claws cut the left side of my face. The weight of the sword caused my feet to keep going, and I ended up on my ass. The cuts healed within seconds. I got back up, heart racing, trying to see where the next attack would come from. I heard living vampires can kill us without much effort. Something about their energy disrupts our healing abilities. Their voice echoed through the room. I looked up to see her standing on the ceiling, looking down with sharp teeth showing. If that was true, then I just needed to land one good hit on her. I doubted I could. She knew what she was doing. I didn't. I know what you're thinking, but I won't give you that chance. She dove down, her face transforming into something monstrous. It felt like time stopped. My mind saw him with intentions. I thought through my next move, but decided to let instinct kick in. I dropped the sword and then swung my arm as hard as I could. I landed a punch directly on the side of her face that hit her so hard she went flying, but it also broke every bone in my fist. I growled in pain, pulling my hand back. 
It took a minute, but the bone started to heal. Once done snapping back into place, the pain was worse than breaking them. The vampire got on all fours and hissed, her face dented from the blow. She started to heal, but I guessed it was slower than she liked. I didn't want to risk hurting myself again and turned to using the sword. She straightened up, face bruised as much as her pride. I didn't want to pull this out for the likes of you. She growled and reached into the small pouch attached to a belt. She pulled out a small vial I assumed to be blood. The look she gave me sent chills down my spine. Did you know bitten vampires can get more powerful if they drink the blood of other supernatural creatures? Depending on how powerful the creature is, the vampire can gain their abilities for a short while. Vampires sure do like their villain speeches. Fine by me. It gave me time to get mentally prepared. She tossed back the liquid, the blood taking effect immediately. Fur grew over her arms as her hands turned into sharp claws. Her legs transformed into what appeared to belong to a wolf. Her body grew denser and her eyes glowed yellow instead of red. She wasted no time charging in my direction. Her mouth open and claws ready. If she landed one attack, I would be dead. I inhaled and focused. My legs wanted to run. Thoughts of summer kept my feet in place. I followed her movements and let her claws sink down into my shoulders I brought the sword up. She backed up, but I was faster. I nearly cut off her left arm, then nearly dropped the weapon because of the pain and its weight. She backed off screaming. Her face twisted in hatred and anger. Again, my wounds started to close, but I felt dizzy. I didn't have enough energy to fully heal. Any more attacks and I was done for. You bitch! She shouted. I wanted to say the same thing about her. I gritted my teeth while staying silent. She decided to no longer mess around. A few more vials came from her pouch and I knew I was, for lack of a better term, fucked. She drank them all at once, some blood spilling down her face, but it didn't matter. The mixture of so much power contorted her body. Cracks and groans came from her bones and her flesh shifted around trying to accept the magic from so many different sources. Her body grew so massive, I didn't understand how it fit inside the room. I suddenly thought we weren't really in the basement of the church. The twins must have used some sort of power to create a safe space for them that this monster broke into. When her body finally settled, it had become something I had little hope of defeating. The face turned into something almost rat-like with rows of teeth. Her body was long with small wings tucked against her back. A tail as sharp as a whip cracked behind her as she ran across the ceiling. The long claws digging into the stone, sending debris falling to the floor. I was too scared to move. Yesterday, I had worried about my life being in a rut, and now I was facing a monster made of nightmares. The twins must have known how outmatched I was. A pair of whites shot out across the room, distracting the monster's attention. Ribbons of fog gracefully avoid attacks thrown their way. Run, came a whispered voice. I saw a set of wooden stairs that led into the ceiling I could have sworn weren't there before. The orange glow of safety came from an opening at the top of them. My mouth became dry at the thought of just running away. My heart skipped a beat when I heard a terrible wailing sound. The monster had caught one of the twins in her teeth. She bit down on the fog that transformed back into Uma. Her stomach ripped open from the fangs. The other twins screamed, seeing their sibling get tossed to the ground, blood pouring from their wounds. Fear took over my body. I could only repeat a single word in my mind. Run. Just run and save Summer some other way. I struggled to take in air when a simple fact fully sank in. If I ran, the three of them would die. I didn't like Hunter, but I couldn't leave the twins to be devoured. Hey, come and choke on this! I shouted, trying to get the monster's attention. To my horror, it worked. She dropped down, landing hard on the floor. No logic was behind her glowing eyes. The vampire had turned feral when she transformed. She came barreling towards me, and I did what my body wanted to since the start of this fight. I ran. We met in the middle, her mouth open, ready to take me out in a single bite. I sidestepped the attack and swung the sword as hard as I could as if it was a baseball bat. It caught the side of her mouth, her legs unable to stop from charging forwards with such short warning. The sword was heavy and it burned. My muscles strained so hard, I thought I heard some snap. Whatever weapon I was using, it was clear I wouldn't be able to carry it. It rejected me. A burst of heat came from the hilt, burning away the layers of flesh on my hands. I screamed in pain, but pressed on. It took muscles ripping, flesh burning, and bones breaking under the weight of the sword to finally cut along the entire side of the monster. I collapsed the moment the blade tore through the last of the monster's flesh. She was dead before I reached the end, but I couldn't get myself to stop. The sword clattered to the ground, covered in blood and gore. I fell face first, body broken. The pain was overwhelming. 
I wanted to roll over and die. My hand smoked as fresh skin started to creep back over the exposed bone. I used what strength I had left to raise my head enough to see Mouse go over to Uma. At least one of them was still alive. I felt a hand on my shoulder. My eyes drifted shut after I saw Hunter next to me. I believe you. We'll go and save your friend. He said just before I blacked out. I wasn't out for long. He force fed me some more of his blood when I was on the verge of death. That kicked in my healing enough to wake up. He handed over a bag of blood that wasn't his. It tasted fine, but knowing what I was drinking grossed me out. I could sit up, but it would take longer for me to fully recover. It felt like I had been hit by a truck. Are they... I slowly asked, looking for the twins. To my relief, Uma was doing better than me. Vampires have good healing abilities. I've heard that even some of the older, more powerful ones can live after getting their head cut off. I set aside the empty blood bag, my stomach churning as I tried to keep it down. I don't like how I just drank some blood someone donated for a better cause. I mentioned. It wasn't donated. Born vampire families had a system to get their blood through. They trade some vampire blood for medical reasons, and they pay people for their blood to consume. They also make sure that every bag they drink, another is used for transfusions. Well, that made me feel a little better there was a system in place instead of vampires leeching off an already limited medical supply. I bet this only happened in certain areas and with trusted organizations. I doubted doctors were aware of the whole vampire blood exchange thing. What's the plan to save Summer? I asked, still feeling sore as hell. I'll call an organization who deals with this kind of stuff. They're swamped, so I doubt they'll send anyone to help for another week. It's nearly sunrise. You go home and get some rest. I'll meet you before sunset tomorrow. We'll take care of Noir together. I wasn't entirely on board with Hunter's plan. It was far too simple. There wasn't anything else we could do. I didn't have the time to train. If Noir hadn't hurt Summer yet, he would have killed her the moment he found out I filled my task. If I didn't rest during the day, I would stand no chance of fighting tonight. Doesn't sound like much of a plan. I told him. You didn't have much of a plan when you came here and look at where you are now. Alive and with someone on your side. He replied. Well, that was true. He walked over to the sword and picked it up. He cleaned it off and then noticed I was watching him. What's up with that? Is it cursed or something? Because it nearly killed me. It's made of pure silver. Supernatural creatures are weak against silver. It's a miracle you were able to even pick this up. Don't try it again. I'll let you use a silver dagger tonight. I thought I heard vampires didn't like silver along with werewolves. What other creatures were out there, and how had they gone undercover for so long? My brain hurt too much to think about that. I wish we could just summon their super great-grandfather and be done with all this. I grumbled. Hunter suddenly appeared serious. He had softened a little after I got my ass kicked a second time. Now, he stiffened at the suggestion of wanting to get some help from an ancestor of the twins. You're new to all of this, so you don't understand what kind of monster Noff and his sons are. He's not like Dracula. The novel describes a weaker generation vampire. The original is impossible to comprehend. He has lived longer than our son. He has the power to destroy universes with a flick of his fingertip and has. The scariest thing about him is he feels love and that makes him unpredictable. His sons are a slight step down. If I could remove the power to summon the younger son without harming the twins, I would. I've even considered killing them if they ever discovered the method of summoning to avoid even a chance of bringing the beast to this world. Again, my head was swimming. Some of the things Hunter was saying were impossible. How is a creature that I assumed looked human older than the entire human race? Was this monster something else that slowly changed over time? Wait, are you implying a multiverse theory? I said, my voice sounding as tired as I felt. It's not a theory. There are countless universes like our own, all dealing with different kinds of supernatural creatures. Some of them can use magic to travel between them, but don't worry about it. Hunter said, shrugging off a bomb he just dropped. What? I said with as much emphasis as I could on each letter. Don't worry about it. He said again. He helped me to my feet to start half-dragging my body towards the stairs. Tell me where you live. I'll meet you tomorrow. Get some rest. He left no room to disagree. Within a few minutes, I'd given him my address and we agreed on a time to meet. I felt too tired to do anything but started to head home. My jogging pace was faster than most people's running speed. It took double the time to get back than it did arriving in the church. The sun was rising by the time I came up to my RV. 
The bright light stung my eyes and already burned my exposed skin. Shattered glass was still littered inside my small home. I wanted to pass out, but I did a quick clean of my bed. I taped up some cardboard to block out the light, and my body gave out. Before I drifted off, I set an alarm so I would wake up before sunset. Writing down what happened helped put my thoughts in order. I silently prayed Summer was alright. I didn't care if I lived or died tonight, as long as she was safe in the end. I woke up a few hours before sunset. I lazed around for a bit, not ready to get out of bed or off my phone. Then someone started knocking at the RV door. Refusing to leave, I still felt like I'd been run over several times by a truck. Crawling out of bed, I yelled at whoever was knocking to come in, assuming it was Hunter. Instead, I saw someone I hadn't seen in a few years. He wasn't a bad person, but he still brought back bad memories. Sheriff, what do you need? I asked as I looked at the older man standing inside my glass-covered living space. He took note of the damage, hands on his hips. I should have known the noise from last night wouldn't go unnoticed, but never thought he would come in person. Did something happen last night? He asked. He sounded more like a disappointed father than mine ever did. I shrugged, not having a cover story for what happened. You'll never believe me if I told you. I said, sounding as worn out as I felt. Vampires? Okay, maybe he would believe me if I told him. I froze, shocked that word came out of his mouth. Did everyone on the planet know more about vampires than I did? I didn't believe in them until three months ago. Then, this jackass comes rolling in and threatens our town along with a few around us. Somehow, I got in contact with the big government agency that deals with stuff like those X-File people. They said if he sticks to feeding on approved victims, he and his little pack can live free. Who would have thought the monsters had rights? The sheriff said, clearly disgusted over the idea. If it was up to him, he would have killed any vampires invading his small town. I doubted a normal human who didn't have access to superhuman strength or silver swords could take down monsters. His hands were tied, and he hated that. I met that jackass last night. I told him and opened my mouth so he could see the sharp set of fangs poking out. He appeared shocked, and I saw his hand reach for his gun. Because the sun was still out, he held off shooting me, knowing I wasn't a full monster and didn't know how. They have a friend of mine hostage. I met someone who can help me take him down tonight. I don't know if we'll be able to pull it off, but I don't care if I die or not. I just need to save her. The older man studied me for a long time. I didn't know what was going through his head. I respected him. He always tried to do the right things, regardless of if he was a bit clumsy with how he did so. I hoped he didn't offer to help tonight. Aside from having access to guns, he didn't have any kind of power to fight against real monsters. I was told to call that agency if these vampires started to target outside of the approved victims. They can eat people with no family to miss them, the homeless or criminals. I fully disagree with anyone getting fed to monsters. I couldn't save those people, but I can try and save you. You count as these creatures hurting someone they shouldn't. I know that agency is backed up, but they might come in two or three days because of what happened to you. What he said felt weird. I lived in an RV. I did hold down a job, but I had no close relationships. I'd barely spoken to my family in years, and I had no hopes of a future. I was exactly the kind of person who those vampires should eat instead of someone with more potential. Don't bother. It's not a big deal. I'm like this now. The guy I met is going to call the same agency, but they won't show up on time. Then wait until they do. It doesn't make sense for you to go rushing into a fight. He sounded exactly like a stern father telling a child not to do anything stupid. I can't wait. They'll kill her and come for me anyway. Besides, I can hold my own. I've taken a few jerks down before, even with my bum leg. I flexed. They made the mistake of taking it easy on you because of your bum leg. Listen, if you're doing this because of what happened to Rudy or your sister... He started, but I cut him off. This has nothing to do with that. I said sternly. We got locked into a standoff. He wanted to say I was only doing this because I couldn't help two people I cared about years ago. The past wasn't related to what was going on now. Summer was kidnapped by vampires who would kill her if I didn't do something. Simple as that. Alright, just be careful. There is nothing wrong with running away and regrouping. I'm sure your friend doesn't want you to get hurt trying to save her. I agreed with him on that last point. I was tired of running. It felt like I'd been doing that for far too long. A voice called for us from outside. The sheriff was ready to shoot, but I told him it was just Hunter. We both walked outside to greet him. He knows what's going on. I told Hunter. 
The other man took something from his pocket and tossed it at the sheriff to catch. It looked like a coin of some sort. The older man looked confused over the exchange. Some vampires have mind control powers. If he was under some sort of spell, he would have flinched suddenly coming into contact with Silver. Hunter explained. I didn't even consider the idea of the sheriff working for the other side. He gave back the coin and Hunter gave him a silver dagger just in case Noir decided to visit him for whatever reason. I doubted the vampire really cared about what a human was up to, but it did make me feel better he was a bit more protected. I'll still make the call and tell them to send someone out here ASAP. These vampires aren't your problem. The sheriff told us. They're not his problem, but they are mine. I get paid for this sort of stuff. Hunter explained. Then you're crazy. My older friend said the words I thought for a while. I'm not. My mother had me tested. We all stood in stunned silence at the response. Was that a Big Bang Theory reference? I asked slowly. I don't know what that is. Hunter replied as if we were the crazy ones. Did this guy only watch vampire movies? The sheriff left, promising to support us the best way he could. He offered to drop off some weapons, but Hunter told him guns wouldn't work against anything but a weaker new vampire. A phantom pain of where I had been shot flared up, and it healed without a scar, but I still felt bitter about it. Hunter and I spent until sunset getting ready. He gave me some tips on how to fight, and offered to let me drink some of his blood to get stronger. Apparently, taking it directly from the source gave some sort of boost compared to just drinking from a bag he'd brought over. I couldn't do it. My fangs retracted at the thought of biting down on his neck. It may be a mixture of not being into guys or the memory of him kicking my ass that made my body react the way it did. I did risk going feral if I took in too much power I wasn't ready to control, so overall, I didn't think the risk was worth it. He accused me of making excuses. I didn't care what he had to say. I wasn't going to neck him. We didn't need to wait long after the sunset for Noir and his goons to show up. The sheriff had lied about a gas leak to empty the RV park to ensure no one else got caught up in our fight. Noir stopped a good distance away in case I had any smart ideas. Red and glowing eyes stared from the darkness of the nearby forest. He brought a lot of backup. Some of them didn't even look like vampires because of what blood they had drank recently. I hated how hard my heartbeat gave away how stressed I felt. I did what you asked. Now show me if Summer is alright. I demanded with only a slightly shaking voice. Noir looked at my feet to the still bodies of the twins he wanted dead. He raised a hand so one of his minions could drag Summer into sight. I wanted to run to her, but I stayed still. My entire body was tense. Another vampire walked forward to retrieve the bodies. Just before it reached them, Noir spoke up. Do you really think I would fall for this? He asked in a low voice. One of the bodies shot to their feet, the spell hunter put on himself breaking. He cut the vampire in front of him in half with one quick motion of his sword. He got ready to continue his attack when my body moved on its own. To my horror, Noir got inside my head. I could do nothing but watch as I attacked Hunter. I twisted his arm back, making him drop the sword. I then grabbed it to throw it as hard as I could off into the forest. He recovered and shoved a silver coin onto my forehead, breaking off Noir's control. He gave me a disappointed look, but didn't say anything about my weakness that caused us to lose an important weapon. You may not have brought me the twins I wanted, but you did deliver the hunter that has been a thorn in my side. One of my dear girls went after you last night and didn't return. I didn't think you could have won against her, but I doubt you can handle the rest of my newly formed clan. Noir opened his arms, dramatically making him look more like a massive tool. All of the vampires around us hissed or growled trying to strike fear in our hearts. I hated to admit it, but this looked bad. I only won against the monster the night before because of the sword I now didn't have. I held a silver dagger that was much easier to handle, but I doubted we could win in a fight with so many creatures when Hunter was knocked out in one hit from that female vampire. Noir gave the silent signal for his vampires to attack. One jumped down from the RV, eyes glowing and face distorted. He landed on me as I stabbed the dagger deep into his chest. Before I went down, I saw one of those larger creatures leaping towards Hunter. I tossed off the limp body just in time to see the monster's mouth inches away from his face. I thought he was dead at that moment. He moved almost too fast for me to see. His fist contacted the monster's face, an explosion of white light nearly blinded my eyes. The jaw was blown apart, and pieces of bone and blood flew outwards. The beast collapsed as Hunter started to jog on the spot, hands raised in a boxer's stance. A slight white glow came from his fingerless black gloves. I could hear his steady heartbeat. He was cool and calm, and that pissed me off. How did he take one of those things out so fast when he had trouble before? 
I realized he had pretended to get knocked out as a test. He tossed me to the other vampire to see if I was truly a victim or made up some sort of sob story to lure out the twins. I could have died. It would take a lot for me to fully forgive him for that. Larger monsters came towards him. Human or not, he held his own. I helped by distracting the smaller ones. The dagger caused too much damage for them to heal quickly enough to recover before another blow. It was a good weapon, but I wouldn't be able to use it for much longer. The flesh on my hand had already started to burn through a glove Hunter gave me. The weapon felt a hundred times heavier than it should. I wasn't entirely human anymore. Silver didn't agree with me, and I was feeling the drawbacks of being around it. Within a few minutes, I noticed Hunter's breathing get harder. He wouldn't be able to fight forever. We made a dent in the small horde. Noir didn't appear upset over the casualties on his side. He could just make more. If we could just keep this up, then we may have a chance. Then, the tide turned in the worst way. The vampires backed off as three more showed up, dragging behind what I never wanted to see. They had the twins, the pair too scared to struggle. They were dropped in Noir's feet, both holding each other for support. Finally, things are going right for me. Soon no one will be able to doubt my power. Noir cackled and it made my blood run cold. Kidnapping them isn't anything impressive. I bet they came right out if you lied and said you were holding us hostage. Hunter said, his unimpressed tone mocking the powerful vampire in front of him. Noir stopped laughing and glared in his direction. The twins gave a small apology, showing that was exactly what happened. I liked those two, but they weren't exactly the brightest bulbs. Noir reached down and grabbed Mahos by the throat. He lifted the smaller vampire off the ground and ripped his claws deep into flesh. I shouted at such a terrible sight. I moved to try and stop the attack. More vampires got in my way. It felt like no matter how many times I brought down the dagger, I wasn't getting any closer. By the time I made a path, Noir had moved on to Uma. The screams of pain caused my body to stop in its tracks. To be extra cruel, he tossed both bloodied bodies a few feet away from us. The twin stomachs were nothing but a mess of gore, and their throats ripped out. My vision grew blurry. The smell of blood made my stomach churn, and my mouth filled with saliva. I didn't know if I was going to puke or if my new body wanted that blood. The world was spinning. It didn't feel like I was standing on steady ground. My hand shook so much that I had nearly dropped the dagger. My breathing grew rapid. I couldn't handle this. I was going to fail to save anyone. I didn't want to see more death. Not again. I wasn't strong enough to do anything. My legs strained against staying still. I wanted nothing more than to run. A hand on my shoulder brought my mind back. You're spiraling. Somehow, those words forced me to breathe. I tightened the grip on my dagger, trying to steady myself. The twins weren't dead yet. Didn't Hunter say vampires were good at healing? If we got them help fast enough, then maybe they could be saved. We weren't done just yet. Noir may have been reading my mind. He snapped his fingers to summon something from the forest. A creature larger than my RV slid out from between the trees, the body a mixture of a lizard and a bat. It stomped its feet, the glowing eyes seeing a meal. I counted seven more weaker vampires, including the one holding a terrified summer. I got the big one, you get the rest. Hunter said, turning to face the new threat. Seems fair. I agreed, feeling as ready to fight as I ever would be. I really wish you would have bitten me. Hunter said and took one step towards the larger monster. No homo though. He added, and I choked on his dumb comment. If he was comfortable to joke around, then he believed we could handle this. He knew more about vampires than I did, so I trusted him. We split off, him clashing around away with the beast. I tore through the other human form monsters. After four, the dagger became too much for me to use. I dropped it, letting myself go semi-feral. I clawed at eyes and ripped at throats with fangs. I let them injure me if that meant I got close enough to snap my teeth down on their flesh. The pain didn't matter anymore. I would heal fast enough. The only thing that mattered was defeating the ones in my way. A blast of heat and light came right after. I finished off the last minion. To my horror, I saw Hunter get blown back. Whatever he did took off the head of the monster he had been fighting, but it hurt him almost as much. His chest was badly burned, and he was smoking. His hands were as burned as his chest, his gloves missing. He stood long enough to collapse near the twins. His last action was reaching out, trying to take a hold of one of their hands. The only ones left standing were Noir, Summer, and me. He had roughly taken hold of her after that last vampire tried to kill me. I was out of energy, my wounds weren't healing as fast as before, and my entire body throbbed with pain. My legs shook, ready to give out at any second. I gasped for air, trying to recover. Noir twisted Summer's arm behind her back when she tried to take a step in my direction. 
Get your fucking hands off her. I growled, my chest full of hatred towards that man. Noir's expression turned into a confused one. He glanced down at Summer, and his mouth grew into an amused smile. Soon, he started to laugh in a way that made me want to rip out his throat even more. Summer looked like she was about to cry, but not because of the pain of her arm getting twisted back. Er, you think Summer is a girl? Is that why you're playing a white knight? Noir mocked between laughter. Summer tightened her lips, eyes towards the ground, and tears threatened to spill out. She was thinking about how deep her voice was and how flat her chest looked. She chewed on her lips, wondering how I would react to something she never tried to correct me on. Damn straight I know she's a girl. I said, my voice as certain as I felt. A silent, grateful expression came over her face. She blinked away tears and did something none of us expected. In a flash, her smaller body turned and climbed over Noir, so her teeth could reach into his neck. She used fangs to tear out flesh before he gave her an order to stop. Noir saw Summer as weak. He never gave her an order not to attack him because he never saw her as a threat. He had enough time to react, but didn't because his brain didn't believe what was happening. Summer knew she was weaker and waited until she was close to him. This entire time, she played the damsel in distress waiting for the right moment. That didn't come without risk. I screamed when I saw Noir force his hand through her stomach. Even with his throat ripped out, he was able to fight back. He withdrew his arm and grabbed a hold of the back of her shirt. He was tossed aside, my body finally moving, I caught her. She gasped in my arms, eyes barely open and face covered in blood. Noir blindly shot out what I assumed to be magic trying to kill us. A blast was going towards where the twins and Hunter were. I knew if it hit them, they would die. I raced over and blocked the attack with my back, the power making me drop poor Summer to the ground. I could only place my body between all of them until Noir calmed down. He gasped and raged over his wounds. I didn't have the strength to do anything but sit up and watch his wounds slowly heal. As he held his torn open neck, he started to drink vial after vial of blood. When he ran out, he turned on one of the bodies of the fallen vampires. Within seconds, he drained the body dry. His wounds healed, but he was almost as low on energy as I was. I could feel how weak he was, but couldn't do a damn thing about it. I felt a hand take mine. Summer reached over, her face strained. He mouthed a single word, one I never wanted to think about again. Run. Her eyes closed. I took hold of her limp body trying to find her weak heartbeat. It was there, but unless I did something soon, she was going to die. All of us were. My mind raced trying to think of what to do next. Where did I drop the dagger? Could I find it in time? What about the sword? No, I couldn't leave these four behind. If I moved, they died. If I didn't kill Noir, he would kill us. Could Summer drink some of my blood and recover? What if she drank some of Hunter's? Would he be able to live through that? You're spiraling. Recalling those words did nothing to help. The smell of blood was overwhelming. I couldn't focus. No matter what I thought of, I saw no way out. Noir could control me if I attacked him. I was powerless, utterly powerless to save anyone. My chest hurt over that realization so much that it felt like it was going to cave in. In that moment, I had nearly given up hope. I wasn't aware that right next to me, I had what could save us, shining in the moonlight. The clouds parted and my eyes were attracted to a slight shine coming from Uma's stomach wound. My brain slowly adjusted to accept what I was seeing. I carefully reached out to take hold of a metal object that had been embedded in her organs. I winced, removing it while silently apologizing to her for the action. I was holding an ornate bar with a notch in the middle. Noir wasn't aware of my actions. He was too busy going into another villain speech I wasn't paying attention to. I felt sick reaching over Mouse to dig around in his wound to find another bar that looked like the first one. When they had said being able to summon their ancestor was inside of them, I didn't think it would be literally inside them. Noir finally saw what was in my hands, if the color could drain from his face, it would have. His mouth dropped open, fear clear on his face. He started in an order, but I was faster. I pressed together the pieces of metal to make a cross. I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't have any other options. The world around me froze. I felt the pressure appear all around, and the air felt thicker than honey. A rumbling shook the ground as the sky turned a deep shade of red. Crashes of sound came from all around each burst getting closer and closer. My chest tightened in a primal fear that overtook my body. Another sound came, and I was too scared to realize it was that of my teeth chattering. Blue lightning came down, leaving a formless shape of white behind. My body almost couldn't handle being so close to so much pure magic in the air. 
Slowly, the power pulled together into a vague outline of a person. White glowing bat wings stretched out into the sky. The wings slowly shrank down, tucking themselves tightly against the ancestor's back. He wore flowing white fabric that moved on its own. Long, pure white hair that touched the ground covered half of his face, but I wasn't able to see what he looked like. For a moment, a bat-like face showed, and then it blurred. Countless faces shifted within seconds. My mind couldn't keep up or comprehend what this monster truly was. The younger son held so much power he stopped the world around him and transformed it into something else entirely. I wasn't on the same level to see his true form, just the vaguely human-shaped one. If he was like this, then what was his father like? I couldn't even fathom it. I felt unseen eyes land on me. My body shut down for a second, my vision turned gray, and everything hurt. And yet I fought through it all to say a single word. Help. He would, at the very least, heal the twins. They were family, after all. But what about the other two I cared about? I felt a wave of magic in my direction so heavy it made my lungs stop. When I recovered, I saw the twins were perfectly fine, but Summer and Hunter still were frozen in time, wounded. I opened my mouth to beg this force of nature to save them as well. To my sheer horror, the younger son was in front of me. He placed a single finger on my forehead. I started to fall into the ground, back to the past into the worst day of my life. I was no longer facing a mind-bending powerful monster. I was walking down the street scrolling through my phone with my sister and my best friend Rudy next to me. I wasn't paying attention to what they were saying. I missed out on their last words because I was too focused on texting a girl I thought was cute at the time. I heard the car, but didn't see it. I didn't realize we had been hit until I woke up in the middle of the road, blood covering the side of my face and my leg twisted. The pain didn't hit for a few seconds. My first thought was how I wouldn't be able to stay on any of my sports teams. My second thought was about my sister. I saw Rudy first, with his head turned around at an impossible angle. I knew right away he was gone. When I saw my sister twitch, I didn't do anything. I couldn't bring myself to move. I sat as the pain overtook everything else. The sound came of the crashed car straining against the road barrier and finally dropping off the bridge. The driver had a heart attack. He had been having chest pains and decided he was well enough to drive himself to the hospital. He was dead before his car hit us. I closed my eyes and opened them again, staring at my phone. I was trapped inside my body, playing at the motions of that day. I knew I just wasn't mentally there. This monster literally brought me back to that moment in time. I knew what was coming, and yet I couldn't stop it. I strained to hear what my sister and Rudy were saying. I've always regretted not hearing his last words. I was in the hospital for Rudy's funeral. I could have attended, but deep down it felt like if I went to his service, then that was it. He was dead. His parents didn't force me. They didn't blame me for not going. Again, walking down the street, my two loved ones were next to me until the car hit us. I knew it was just useless, but I fought against my body trying to change the outcome. I should have traded places with my sister. Why didn't I let her walk so close to the road? The wife of the man who caused the accident came to the hospital. She apologized for what happened, face full of grief. She lost someone she cared about in the same accident and yet I did something I've always regretted. I snapped at her, saying she should be sorry because her husband killed Rudy and might as well have killed my sister. She accepted my anger and left the room. I heard she died a few months later of breast cancer. Why was this monster making me relive all of this over and over again? I lost track of how many times the car hit us, how many times I saw Rudy's body, how many times I saw my sister bloody and alone on the road. I could have crawled over to her, but I didn't. I left her and just focused on my pain even though I came away with the least amount of injuries. Again, I felt the car hit us. She's still alive. The accident caused brain damage. She is now on the same level as a five-year-old. She won't ever get to finish high school, go to college, get married, and have kids. I saw her a handful of times after the accident. My parents can't retire because they used all their savings for her medical costs, but they love her. They love her so damn much. I was nothing but a burden on them. I told my father to focus all their attention on her. I would send whatever money I could, but I wasn't ready to be her brother. I ran. I've been running for years. Again, I sat in the middle of the road, leg twisted, my best friend gone and my sister alone. Something inside snapped. I started to scream until my lungs gave out. 
I vented all the pain, anger, and shame from my past actions. I've never hated myself more than in that moment. I should have been there for her. I should have listened to what they were saying. I should have been the brother she needed after the accident. Instead, all I've done is blame others and run from my mistake. I screamed, my throat raw. I gasped deep, painful gulps of air. Tears stung my eyes. The pain in my leg faded and I saw I wasn't in the middle of the road, but sitting in the grass near my RV. The younger son stood over Summer and Hunter, his clawed hands reaching down to take them. I choked on fear and then noticed the glint of silver dagger in the grass. He was going to kill them. A force of nature I had no chance against was going to take away more people from my life. Slowly, I got to my feet again and I ran. My hand landed on the silver dagger. I picked it up, not breaking my pace. I ran towards that monster to put everything I had into plunging the blade deep into his back. I felt something snap, then I fell forward. I forced myself to sit back up, looking around trying to find the threat. He appeared sitting next to me, knees up to his chin and with a stable human face. What a human reaction. His voice sounded like a soft breeze. It oddly calmed me, along with a smile that made him look almost like a child. I don't know why he put me through the mental trauma he just did, but if he wasn't a threat, now I didn't care for the reason. Please help these two. I'll give you anything. I asked, my voice cracking. You think your life is worthless. You have nothing to offer me. He pointed out. I searched through my mind trying to think of anything to give him in exchange for his help. He wouldn't want money or anything I owned. The cross that summoned him sat in the grass. We both looked at it and he shook his head. That has always belonged to me. I'll take it back in due time. Then what? I rubbed the blood off my face and then stopped. Was my blood worth anything? Suddenly, time around Hunter and Summer unfroze. They both started breathing. Summer was slowly dying again, causing my mind to go into a panic. Could I give Summer some of my blood? No, she would use up all her energy healing her wounds and die anyway. If there was a chance she would live, I needed to take it. I cut open my palm using my teeth, then forced her mouth open. For some reason, the younger son placed a finger in her palm. I saw some white light I now understood to be magic pass into her. After a minute, he spoke. That's enough. I pulled away, relieved to see Summer's wounds finally closed. Her eyes didn't open, but I knew she was going to make it. Why did you help? I asked, knowing if he didn't give up some of his power, she would have healed herself to death. I only raised my finger. The amount of magic I used up was so minuscule, I don't even consider I used any. This person was so strong that Summer's entire life force wasn't even an observable amount to him. We did the same for Hunter, but he only needed two drops of blood and a brief touch to pass on the needed magic. They both needed some rest. I couldn't rely on some help for the next problem. Once the world unfroze, I still needed to deal with Noir. I don't suppose you want to lift another finger for me? I pressed my luck. The younger son gave a smile that made him look a little bit like a happy frog. He admired my courage for asking, but refused the request. His hand reached over to pick up the cross to signal he was leaving soon, and I would be on my own. Bitten vampires have control over other vampires they've turned. However, your heart is still beating, is it not? He hinted. My mouth dropped open a little. I've never considered that Noir didn't have full control over me because I wasn't fully a vampire. Had I really fought hard enough against his control, or did I just accept it because I didn't know better? Thank you, I said as I stood up, dagger in hand ready for a fight. I did nothing. You were able to solve your problems on your own. You just needed a moment to clear your mind. The other vampire corrected. That may be the case, but I still wanted to thank him. Because of him, I stopped running. With a blink of an eye, the world turned back to normal. Noir was confused as hell. The ones he nearly killed were healed aside from myself. Slowly, he started to laugh at the outcome. That's it. You summoned the younger son and nothing happened? What a failure you are. He kept talking, but I wasn't listening. I stared towards him, determined to finish what I needed to do. Do us all a favor and put that dagger through your own heart. He ordered in a rage. My hand twitched as I felt the words hit me. Fuck him. I kept walking. Fear replaced the expression on his face. He shouted another order. My body wanted to stop, but I pressed on. He became frantic with his words, 
not understanding why they weren't working. When I reached him, I kicked the middle of his chest, causing him to fall hard on his back. I fell on him. My sheer rage over how much he hurt Summer took over. He knocked the dagger from my hand, but I switched to my fist instead. He tried to shield his face, but it became clear he had never been in a fight before. His wounds healed almost as fast as I could make them. He started to beg me to just leave, and he would never bother us again. I ignored his promises. My hand found the dagger, and I brought it down over and over again. My chest ached from the effort, and I stopped when my arms refused to move. Noir was reduced to nothing but a bloody mess in the grass. It was over too soon. I wanted to hurt him more. I needed to kill him again. Someone grabbed me from behind to lift me to my feet. My vision turned red as I lashed out trying to kill whoever dared to touch me. Within seconds, I found myself wrapped inside a large jacket, unable to struggle free. When I calmed down, I realized Hunter had his arms around me, pinning mine under his coat. If he hadn't done so, I could have hurt the people I wanted to protect. No homo, he said entirely seriously when he knew I regained my senses. It's a little homo, I told him. Not on my end. When I kicked at his legs, he released me. I wasted no time to see if Summer was alright. He was the one who needed a hug the most out of all of us. He told me that Noir hadn't hurt her while he held her captive, which made me feel much better. The twins couldn't help themselves. They also got in on the hug, both on the verge of tears over how all of us made it out alive. Soon, Hunter joined in, but I think he was trying to be funny. That's how the agents found us, two living vampires, two born vampires, and one hunter huddled in a group hug surrounded by bodies of dead vampires. I was so embarrassed I wanted to die. Late as always. Hunter muttered, seeing backup had arrived. Soon the place was crawling with men wearing suits and a cleanup crew. By the morning, there wouldn't be much of a trace of what happened that night. We needed to be interviewed about what happened. Summer and the twins went first, leaving Hunter and me sitting on the curb by a local gas station. A blonde younger agent offered to buy us a drink and snacks after a long night. When I saw him pull out a wallet with cute frogs printed over it, I wondered what kind of people this agency hired. We got our soda and waited until the others were done. At that time, I filled in Hunter about what happened with the younger son. I didn't leave out anything. He listened to how I needed to face the accident so many times and about how the younger son acted. He was right. He didn't do anything aside from mentally tormenting you and then got you to thank him for it. Hunter said after I finally finished speaking. Maybe I needed to face some facts. I replied defensively. You're new to all this, so you wouldn't understand how frightening these monsters are. They twist words and wear a kind face to gain favor. You would have faced your problems when you were ready. There was no need for him to force you through all that. I bit back a reply. It felt odd to have someone looking out for me after I had pushed everyone away. Damn it, I think me and Hunter were friends. Was it wrong I let him take back that cross? I asked. No, we can't control those beasts. I bet the cross was just an illusion of control. Monsters with that much power do what they want whenever they want because they're desperate for some entertainment. He spoke as if he knew from personal experience. I realized I didn't know much about Hunter, not his real name, or if he really only watched bad vampire movies. I didn't tell him, but I hoped that I could learn just a little bit more in the future. After a very long mess of a night, I was put up in a hotel until my RV was repaired. The corporation acted fast. Any traces were cleaned up and my life was arranged to deal with my new nocturnal schedule. I switched to the overnight shift at the call center, I was put in touch with who I could buy blood from, and I was told if I drank a lot of good blood, I could stay awake all day if needed. Summer quickly got a night job at a nearby gas station. She also started night classes to become a vet. I knew she was smart and hardworking enough to accomplish her goals. I needed to do one last thing. I asked my parents if I could come over. We hadn't seen each other in two years. They looked far too old and frail to be taking care of my sister, and yet they weren't unhappy. I told them I wanted to be more involved in Annie's life. I understood if it was too late. I had refused to see her all this time. We wanted you to be ready for this, and we understood if you would never be ready. If you think you are, then we'll be glad to be a family again. But you need to be certain. Annie needs a brother not one that's going to be in and out of her life. My father told me. I hadn't cried in front of my parents since I was a child. Not even after the accident, I let myself shed tears around them. I let myself cry then. I want to be her brother again. 
I said between heavy sobs. I expected Annie to hate me or to not know who I was. I wasn't expecting her to act as if I never left her behind. I'll never think I deserve her love. That wasn't going to stop me from being with her again. I loved her laugh. I loved how much she wanted to make others laugh with her. She was obsessed with fish and anything orange. She wasn't how I remembered her. A lot had changed, but that didn't mean she wasn't my sister. I was going to cherish every single moment I could get with her from now on. Because I wasn't fully human, I couldn't spend as many days awake as I would like. I often pushed myself too hard and didn't get enough sleep figuring blood would fix it. I didn't have a shift at work after one day I spent with my sister. I decided to take it easy that night and to sleep as soon as I got home. My plans were derailed when I found someone else in my RV. Hunter had a bad habit of showing up. He claimed he was just checking to make sure I hadn't turned into a feral monster, but I think he was lying and just used my place as a safe place to crash. The twins no longer needed him. Others heard that the younger son had been summoned and everyone assumed they knew how. No one corrected the rumors, so now they were safe from anyone trying to mess with them. But now, I was stuck with a monster hunter taking naps with his shoes on in my bed. I learned the hard way not to try and drag him out. I nearly died the last time. He should at least not track so much dirt on my sheets. I made another mistake of trying to take off his shoes while he slept. Soon, I was hauling him out of the RV as my broken jaw healed. I tossed him on the grass and then tried to rub away the dirty boot print from my face. I'm just checking to see if you're still acting human. He lied. Bullshit. I hissed. If this kept up, I was going to charge him an Airbnb fee. I expected him to leave, but he spotted something in the grass near the woods. I've learned in the past few months that he liked animals as much as Summer does. He turned into a different person around cats, without a hint of shame. He baby talked a stray cat out of the woods. He even got on his back so the flea covered thing could sit on his chest and rub against his face. Have you given your future any thought? He asked with his normal voice, still petting the cat. That was a topic I wasn't ready for. I knew I was going to outlive my family. Living vampires don't die of old age. I was offered a job hunting monsters, but I refused. I didn't want to risk my life. I wanted to make up for lost time with my sister. I'm fine with how things are. How about you? I shot his question back at him. For now, I'm going to get this little baby into a vet. Then I'll keep fighting monsters until something kills me. I hated how fast he could switch to the baby talk and then back to being completely serious. Haven't you ever considered something else? I offered. I was born into a hunter family, a real hunter family. They breed down special abilities, making us only useful for killing supernatural creatures. I've never even considered anything like that. I didn't know how to feel about what he said. It wasn't my place to correct his family's ways if I knew nothing about it. You know, hunters from these sorts of families tend to have a fear of supernatural creatures removed from them. You can't fight something you fear. We devote everything to just killing these monsters. I think it backfires sometimes. If you're lacking hatred of something, then what do you fill that space with? I had no idea what he was talking about. I shrugged. He stood up, carefully holding his new cat in his arms. Love. I don't do this job because I hate monsters. I do it because I love the good ones. Killing the bad ones saves nice supernatural creatures just as much as humans. So I really don't mind what I do. I gave him a very long, hard stare trying to spot the lie. Are you fucking with me right now? He smiled in a way that made me think I would never be able to figure him out. He left, cat in hand, and with a promise to come back to check on me. I was tired from a full day out, but I stayed up a bit longer. I sat on the steps of my RV, soda in hand, watching the sunset. I didn't remember sunsets being this beautiful. I wondered if it was because of my new senses or because I never just stopped to look at one before. I did need to think about the future, but for right now, I was happy just watching the days fade away into night.